Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're good. Hope you can hear me loud and clear. I've been bragging in recent days and weeks about this new fancy 4G router thing that I've got. And then it's just packed up in the preamble ahead of the show. And so I'm back on the clinic Wi-Fi. So here we are. If it's glitchy, I'm sorry. I'm working on it. But do let me know if you can hear me loud and clear. Uh, we do have an esteemed guest. I don't know if I can say this about this fellow, but uh, we, it's usually the, usually the term I use about our guests. Uh, so Adam Meekin's going to be joining me. Uh, in a second but uh, it is a new week we had a cracking one last week thank you so much for all your participation especially afterwards it does bleed into my weekends when you guys are, are sending in your comments and feedback and suggestions for future episodes future guests etc which i do really appreciate uh, but i can't get to them all necessarily and so what i try and do is pull them together and one of the things that does often crop up is these sorts of discussions that i'm going to have with adam really is to reflect on contemporary issues and also how arguments cannot become circular how, how can we move forward with things that we've often discussed over and over again how can we see through it and make progress in a direction now what i will uh what we'll do hopefully here we go this is what we're what we're looking at matt spotted the clickbaity title <laughs> alistair beverly crackling's gone good <laughs> for now <laughs> now if this says can understand you though I only, I only assume that's a typo that he can't understand me uh, that's what is usual for the accent right now let me introduce this then because i listened to um adam's podcast recently um he does a naf podcast extra sold i think i've got the uh play on words right there and he he, re, he read out a blog from years ago now i think he's got his timestamps wrong because he reckons it's like 2014 i don't think it's that long ago it makes me feel old and it, that makes it must feel make him feel ancient um and so uh i'm heckling him and he's in the lobby he might just, he might just clear off now um but um basically i then text him saying that it was really nice to to hear it because it made me a bit nostalgic but also i then said what I would like from that as well is your contemporary reflection on those points. Is there anything you would revise? Is there anything you regret? Uh, is, has any of the furor that occurred from it and since made you temper any views or strengthen any views, whatever it might be, just to like a contemporary reflection of it. Uh, and then I suggested that that's all well and good me suggesting it for his extra sodes, but of course he can come on chewing it over if he wishes. And so here he is, he kindly accepted that invite. And so I bring you if the technology allows, Adam Meekins. Hi, Adam. Good afternoon, Jack. How the hell are you? Yeah, not bad, mate. Good. Thank good. You. Thanks for joining me. I, I know that um, it, it, I hopefully, hopefully I've represented what happened there fairly accurately. It was quite organic. I just text you saying, really enjoyed this, but would you fancy doing this? And to which it felt like this platform felt suitable for it. So I think we can start there, if you don't mind, and tell us a little bit about that topic and what, my answer my question is what are your contemporary reflections on that topic as they stand now yeah well as you say it was a um, an extra so that i started doing so i uh, usually on the naf only do one episode a month but i decided to give the uh, listeners a little bit extra meekings because i know people can't get enough of it so i thought i'd do a second uh, episode a month and i uh, thought i would just go through some of my blogs that i've written and just read them out and put them in audio format rather than obviously uh, people having to expend the cognitive effort of reading things because i know nowadays not many people want to read things if they can't hear it or they can't watch it they're not interested in it but yeah it was from 2014 i don't care what you say i haven't got my dates mixed up it was that long ago and that was that was the second controversial blog that I did the first one which was the there's no skill in manual therapy was even um, a couple of months before that you're right it wasn't 2013 when we spoke it was still in 2014 but wow. it was early 2014 and this one was later in 2014 so yeah a good seven eight years ago now and uh, uh, as I say it did create a few debates discussions disagreements complaints uh, levied into various different places uh, and I'm sure it probably does still now. I still think, you know, the topics that I mentioned in that blog about, you know, my views and opinions around manual therapy, my frustrations with it, my annoyance with it in, for various different reasons, um, still pretty much stand now. And uh, it is quite disheartening when I read it out and I'm thinking, I don't think anything's really changed that much. You know, you ask me, you know, right. what's my contemporary view on it now? I pretty much stand by what I said and what I wrote back in 2014. So my current views are we haven't moved much forward. And I and another blog that I wrote was calling about moving forward, trying to move these discussions forward. And 
and I just see it not happening. And uh, and again, if we've got any ideas from anybody listening that want to throw it into the comment section and tell me how the bloody hell can we move these discussions and debates forward and, and move the profession forward as well. Um, I'll, I'll be open to suggestions because I just can't seem to crack it, if I'm being honest. Sure. One of the one of the common accusations that's leveled at you is that that is the polar. You are such a polar cartoonish uh, example <laughs> of what they think is a a hands off discussion, or is that you, you're you're someone that will go as far as to ridicule manual therapy to such a point in which it also then wounds manual therapists. They recognize themselves in your critique in such a way that, that actually they see a paradox between your call for progress and your call for sort of unity. And then they see you as being such a divisive figure because you're too extreme. What's your, what's your sort of take on that? Yeah, but that's their misinterpretation, which is a common thing of my argument. So it is a common misrepresentation and a false dichotomy that they throw at me that when I'm criticizing manual therapy, they're saying we shouldn't touch patients. And that's nothing that I've said in any way, shape or form. <laughs> Um, yeah, so again, it happens all the time, like Jack has said there, and it, and it does annoy me and frustrate me. And I just don't know how to word it any clearer because, again, I've written other blogs that says this hands-on, hands-off debate is a false dichotomy. This criticism and critique of manual therapy has got nothing to do with not touching your patients. And that is just a straw man that is thrown at me all the time, no matter how I word it and no matter how I say it. So this isn't, I don't think... As far as I'm concerned, it's an issue with me. It's an issue with the person that is actually taking the information on and for whatever reason, misinterpreting it willfully or unintentionally. I'm not sure because the old red mist descends, maybe. Sure. But that is that's a cognitive fallacy that the individual is going to have to overcome because that is not, as far as I can see, my fault as much as I try to word it and change the explanations around it in various different ways people still throw this false dichotomy Adam says we shouldn't touch the patients I'm like I've never said that that hasn't <laughs> said that. I, I've said exactly the opposite in half a dozen different blogs now so where are you still throwing this accusation at me my position on manual therapy has always been around the nonsense the crap the the pseudoscience, the the belief of structural and biomedicalism that surrounds it. And, and the biggest thing is the ego and elitism and the hierarchicalness of it. That's the thing that just really gets my hackles up the most. And it needs to change because I find it it's a toxic waste ground of, as I say, vipers nests of egos and elitism. And it's not conducive to a profession that wants to move forward and advance when you've got these gurus out there you've got these people out there consistently saying i'm a better therapist because i've done all these pseudoscientific postgraduate courses and i've got jedi skills with my fingertips and it just alienates a lot of physiotherapists who feel frustrated that they they can't do what they're supposed to be able to do because these gurus are telling them other things you know yeah i mean so i i think that there's there's plenty of misrepresentation that i recognize on that um in in what people have said and i've, I've said to you before and i've said on air uh, on conversations we've had before about the fact that generally speaking there's no way uh, the thing that i'm suspicious of is when people suggest that you need to temper your arguments they are you know I, i've never seen them then give due credit when that's occurred or necessarily engage with the arguments as they're presented and so i do agree with you there that that is often a misrepresentation an argument that could be leveled though is that you're caricaturing you're misrepresenting misrepresenting the how much people are ass asserting that they have jedi skills at their fingertips these days especially i would say i think there are there are fewer and, and it's hard to know whether or not uh you and others have been able to make it less socially acceptable to infer that on mass now than it was when you wrote that. But I would say there are less people prominently suggesting um, said magic hands than they used to. Oh. So it's like you're, scowling at me, you're scowling at me to disagree. So uh, I, I think we're all guilty of living in our own little bubbles, Jack. And uh, I do think we have these little circles that we discuss and talk to people. Uh, and I do think you're right. You know, when we start to get an, a bigger reach and a bigger audience, and people start to draw towards us because of their similar ilk and their similar mindset, because human beings are tribalistic, 
you, we tend to start to see a bigger audience of like-minded people. We go, ah, we've cracked it. We sorted it out. You know, we are beginning to progress forward. But all you've done is just expanded your audience of people that are thinking like you. That doesn't mean there are any less people out there that are thinking completely different from you. So I, I, I see, I, I see the same thing I thought myself. But again, just go on social media and just spend five minutes on Instagram. Have a look at some of the comments in my posts that I posted out there. You'll see that the guruism and the beliefs about, you know, taking skill and needing to do all the manual therapy training. And it takes years and years of practice to perfect and dedicate before you can get these extra sensory palpatory skills, etc. It is still rife everywhere, everywhere. I think, you see, I'm not disagreeing with that. Like, I'm not one that sort of infers that significant progress has been made on all these arguments necessarily. I just think that when you, years ago, we'd have a similar conversation, and I'd grant you that. But now, when I think about your audience, I think about PhysioMatters audience, I think about what Therapy Live did in moving tens of thousands of people, eventually you run out of the, you, you, the, you've got to understand though that macro audience like if you're having to if you're lumping in every other personal trainer and you and you're and you're trying to go so international as to then broaden your base to then make sure that there's some people that are you know full of shit there i think that generally speaking when you think about just how many people are engaging with more sensible materials and they're engaging with these arguments more I do think there has been progress and I don't think I'm being blinded by my own echo chamber there because if it is an echo chamber, that's one hell of a fucking huge chamber, right? It's like there's lots of people. I know the audience numbers and I know that that, that matters. It, it doesn't necess necessarily mean that everything's changed, but it does mean that the exposure again, uh, for the op opposing forces has definitely increased. Oh, you're right. There are more critics, there are more skeptics now than there ever has been, which is good. But I still think it pales into insignificant to the amount of people that are still promoting false narratives, pseudoscience out there. You only have to look outside of the world of physiotherapy to see that. Have a look at the anti-vaxxers, you know, have a look at that. There are more people now that are challenging anti-vaxxers, of course. But, you know, there are now, again, <laughs> increasing amounts of anti-vaxxers because of the COVID virus. And it's, it's the same within all sorts of areas of pseudoscience, within physiotherapy, healthcare diet, nutrition, training, vaccines, etc. is that we're living in a world now where, as you say, in the old saying about, you know, having to refute bullshit takes a magnitude of effort to do, you know, than to actually create it. And so, you know, we need continued skeptics and critics to carry on building up. But I do think we are sometimes, you know, we're patting ourselves on the back, you know, and saying, good job, with more of us going. And I'm like, great, yeah. Keep fucking going. Don't stop. Because that's the other thing I see. People are saying, well, you know, you keep doing this. You keep having the same conversation. I'm like, great. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. Do it more. Get more aggressive with it. Get a little bit more pushy with it, you know, because and then try and get other people going with it as well, because it's just needed. On the numbers, though, that's a good example, right? So it, 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 I'm not suggesting you can't find them. And the anti-vax crowd, it's, it's far bigger than I'd like. But I would suggest that on that, that's a good example of how we know that the nation at large, there's plenty of polling data on this and the uptake on the vaccine has been significant. And, and compared to most countries, it's doing re we're doing really well for vaccine trust and, and sentiment there, right? So that's the sort of example I'm sort of meaning is that of course you can find noisy examples and then you can find heart, you know, skeptics needing to then critique that pretty sharply. But in the middle, you've got people that aren't asked enough either way that have been moved somewhat gently right i'm not necessarily talking about someone that then becomes a vocal campaigner against said bullshit but i'm just talking about the general joe i think that joe blogs the mean has moved okay not maybe as much as we'd like perhaps but generally speaking there is at least a pause i think we've given enough Tens of thousands of people pause for thought when they lay their hands now. Okay. Well, at least on mechanism of effect. Yeah, well, I, I think that is, uh, yeah, you're probably right there. I think there are more, let's say, let's use you, new grads coming out of university. So I speak to a lot of new grads on my courses who come and interact on social media. Uh, and they're saying, you know, the, the old stuff is still being taught. They're still getting told about, you know, having to find a stiff L3 segment, you know, and then trying to work out which direction it needs mobilizing and what grade it needs and all that sort of stuff. They're still getting that information, that training. Uh, but now what they're realizing, obviously, that there's these critics and skeptics out there and they're coming out as new grads and having to unlearn things sooner than 
they than likes of you and me did. So yeah, I do agree that there is this sort of shift, but you know, the, again, the trouble is, is that there is still this problem. I think where a lot of this information is being taught and told to people when it doesn't need to be, and therefore that is confusing and making things harder for the skeptics and critics. And that's why we're just going around in skirt circles. So yeah, I agree. We're probably getting there sooner, but we're still just going and having the same conversation. Sure. Yeah, and and I also really do agree that there's certain there's a there's a really stubborn institutionalized oh. model of that that is incredibly wealthy that that is also got its roots in various different parts of the established order of things that, that is therefore very stubborn and, and, and I'm I'm and sticky and I get that but I suppose I'm, I'm I'm pleased we do we do agree on generally the you know that 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 next next generation at least is giving more pause for thought. My my, my ambition has always been to try and corrupt the youth, you know. So I I, <laughs> I do know I do know changing beliefs and behaviours in somebody that's got them well established after five, ten, fifteen years of practice is unlikely to happen. I'm not saying it's impossible; it's just unlikely to happen. So yeah, my ambitions and my ulterior motives if you want to call that with my skepticism and my criticism and my writing and my social media stuff has always been to corrupt the youth the students to try and get them to see that there is other views out there so i guess yes it is probably working from that process i just don't think it's necessary if we could get the bloody institutions and we can get the universities to update a lot of what they teach I know they're trying. I know they're in a difficult position. All right. I know it takes, you know, a consensus of all the faculty to agree, you know, what goes in the syllabus, what needs to come out of the syllabus. It's probably a full of red tape. It's got, you know, other people's opinions and vested interests because of various different postgraduate courses they may or may not teach as well, which will then, you know, affect what, you know, they believe and everything. So I do know it's a complicated, messy process to try and change university syllabuses, but I just think it needs to be done more across the board. There are some universities that are better than it than others, but, you know, really, I think what we're doing is to say is we're continuing on at the university levels, teaching all this sort of stuff to students, and then they're having to unlearn that sooner and faster than likes of you and me did, which is great. But it's unnecessary. We don't need to do that. And then if we could change that, then I think we'd move things forward a bit sooner and faster. Sure. Well, I'm certainly going to come to the comments in a little while. A um, couple more minutes and then last 10, we're going to have a back and forth with the audience because we've got some lovely comments coming in, I can see. Um, but just before I do, though, I think that the, it's always a, a temptation by anyone that wants to come uh, forward with either new ideas or, or critiquing the old ideas, you know, progressive movements to try to then go towards younger, more impressionable minds. And it totally makes sense. Now, there's one thing where arguably that's one of the reasons they've embedded it and grained it within syllabus is because, of course, they're trying to do the same thing. It's trying to get people into what they consider to be good habits. One of my big frustrations is I just think that people talk past each other so much that essentially a bit like what I noticed Joe Turner's just said in the comments is that unfortunately those discussions and debates between people that do truly disagree on that really struggle to be had because it gets messy. Well, let me just say that a lot of the discussions that I get involved in are not actually for the benefit of me or the other person on the other side. The most of the discussions I get in the public discussions online are for the people watching in who are still to make a decision. So I just want to put it out there that a lot of the stuff that I get involved with, which is a lot less than it used to be, because I'm getting a bit fatigued with it all, if I'm being honest. But, you know, I, I very much know when I do engage with a diehard manual therapist and I am in the comment section in my blog or I am on social media and having a discussion about the benefits and the utility and the effectiveness of dry needling or some other crappy passive treatment, I'm not doing it to change their mind and I'm not doing it to change my mind. I'm doing it for the observer to make up their own mind. I want to put a stronger argument across. I want to try and not make as many logical fallacies or come across as much as a knobhead as the other person I'm in the discussion with. If I can convince someone through hearts and minds and science and logic, and they will then say, you know what, I think dry needling isn't all that clever because I just saw that discussion that Adam had with the dry needling advocate, I'm happy. Mm. Yeah, and and I think um, that, that that's something that people do make a mistake of thinking is that you're trying, you're always trying to change the mind of the interlocutor rather than recognizing the audience effect and the fact that we're trying to drag standards by at least them observing that back and forth and recognizing which which person's arguments stand more to hold more water. One other thing on that though, with regards to the the influence of of of, of the 
to new graduates. It's hard to always just say the youth because it's kind of the youth of our profession or industry rather than necessarily direct youth these days. But what I, what I would say is that generally that uh, argument, regardless of what the topic is, is often the vulnerability to it is that you're trying to, yes, they're impressionable minds, but they're also sometimes lacking in the life experience to recognize the pragmatics of things, right? So you end up in a situation where it becomes an academic argument or a theoretical argument that isn't necessarily having to stand the test of time practically. So in this instance, it's people that are, they may well recognize that actually manual therapy doesn't do what we used to think it does. It might suck. They might want to wear the t-shirt in their mind in terms of theory but when it comes to in practice the application of it at least in a sensible and judicious way of which many of including myself have then started to apply is something that they struggle to engage with as much because they've not had that experience yet and, and that doesn't just have to play into manual therapy of course if you try to ideologically influence any youth the argument is that they haven't had the confrontation of the rubber hitting the road. They've not had the confrontation of the life experience that occurs that might make them more theoretically observant rather than practically. Yeah, I just heard that argument on Facebook post by someone um, who's a physiotherapy business guru who put a post on there. Um, I think it was yesterday. Oh, yeah, I, w I want to try and get that guy yeah, on the show. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I heard that argument. Meaning, I wasn't even I, necessarily yeah, meaning that, that in practical business terms, by the way. No, I'm just meaning that if you think about it's easier to influence the youth, but then there is something to be said about utopianism, isn't there? And that's what I'm meaning. I, I, remember, know I know the video you're meaning, but I didn't mean that, actually. Well, I was going to say, but I, I don't know about that, Jack, but, you know, the argument that, you know, you've got to let a young physiotherapist make the same mistakes you made and I made because it is a rite of passage everyone goes through, I don't agree with. You know, I, I, I think that's a nonsense. It's a, it's a fallacy. So, you know, the belief is, is that, you know, our manual, uh, a physiotherapist has got to do five years at the front line in a physio meal, grinding it out, you know, seeing 20 patients a day, putting their hands on every patient before they are in a position to be able to make a decision for themselves. I'm like, that's absolute nonsense. No, they don't. They can make an informed, scientific, evidence-based reason based on, you know, lots of sources of information as soon as they want. They don't have to have five years experience before they have got the right to make a decision of how they practice, in my opinion. No, fair enough. Now, I'm just opening up the comments section. and It's kicking off a lot. lot. I saw Bernadette Jones. I had, I had got Adam completely wrong until now. <laughs> See, it takes for me to tease out these variables to bring out the best in you, mate. You should, you should have a weekly slot. I get that um, a lot, Bernadette. If it's any consolation, uh, I get a lot. I, I'm just misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but let's not feel too sorry for him. No, no, please shine. don't. No, I'm not perfect um, in any way. <laughs> Evie no. said uh, people misrepresent your views on purpose when they don't like you and they're being a bit shite. <laughs> yeah but you know again you know that is humans that's human nature i've learned over the years that's what happens and uh, if i'm being honest i've done that a couple of times i've made that mistake you know as well it happens yeah anna maria's comment here of course i adore because it says jack chu totally agree that the mean has moved so thank you anna um matt scarsbrook her her uh, co-conspirator on the massage matters podcast has said does adam think his approach to challenging these narratives results in a backfire effect where those who need to change dig their heels in rather than listen is there a need for more therapist-centered approach to this education style? So the backfire effect happens in all different ways. I've tried various different approaches. I've tried various different styles. And it's like, no matter how polite, how kind, how fluffy around the edges you are, you always get a backfire effect when you challenge beliefs and expectations. So I would say, yes, it probably is a little bit less of a backfire effect, but you know, it is, it's something that we have to recognize occurs when you are challenging beliefs, no matter how you present them. So I have realized that there is a middle ground here. If you're too hard, okay, and you're too aggressive and blunt and direct, yeah, that just creates huge amounts of backfire. If you're too polite and fluffy, the backfire effect is a little bit less, but nobody changes their bloody mind or opinion or you're not heard. So it just gets lost into the ether. So you need a little bit of balance between the both. So I would say, yes, there is a role here for toning language and views and opinions down a little bit. You know, at the end of the day, um, one of my sort of inspirational quotes I look, look, look to a lot of the time when it comes to, you know, disagreement is what Gandhi said. Honest disagreement is a good sign of progress, but you need to say, find that middle ground to connect with somebody to actually start the process of progress. It has to be honest. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. The, the core yeah. things that's really frustrating that sometimes it's that ability to, yeah, like you said, the, the red mist needs to settle. 
if it's there um, in order for us to sort of make some make some progress. One of the things that I remember in, on a NAF podcast of, of yesteryear that uh, Jack March and Rob Tyre of Physio Matters fame, uh, they came on the show. One of the points that they made there I thought was really interesting is that one of the things that kind of means that the slogan here in the manual therapy sucks type stuff or the, the sort of you being inferred to be a bit of a nihilist when fundamentally there's more nuance under your opinion than there is, is in part because the way that you define manual therapy doesn't involve saying getting hold of a getting hold of a limb in a professional manner and, and, and sort of giving the comfort and reassurance to put someone through range, for example, if they're being really, really limited with and, and tense through their hip and you're sort of demonstrating to them that range of movement and, and going through that motion with them uh, in a collaborative manner, you wouldn't consider that manual therapy. No. Nope. Why? Because that's, that's sort of, you, you've defined your own terms to suit your own narrative, haven't you? No, man, manual therapy is, is, a, is this formalized approach that says you have to do it in a specific format. So that, that is not manual. In your opinion? No, but it's, that's what I was taught. That's what is still, sure that is what is still being taught. Why, why do make the modes still exist? Why do you have yeah. to push the C5 facet joint in and the oblique direction towards the opposite eye when you're trying to do an HVLA? Why, well, why you know do you, you have to rub you won't get me defending that. Why do you have to do transverse friction massages across in a transverse direction for five minutes? So well, all you the know you won't get me defending that. Right? So, so use this. Let's let's not. I won't be. I won't pretend I'm being devil's advocate now, right? I think that one of the weaknesses to your argument is that you define your terms around the, those parameters, right? I don't defend any of the things you're just reeling off. Yeah. But what I've just described is a manual therapy that I practice. No, it's not and manual therapy. That 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 is that is not? that is in your opinion. <laughs> That is not a formalized specific treatment. That is an individual based uh, thing that you're doing on your clinical reasoning process that, that will help that person and that patient, which will be different for the next patient who walks in through the door. But it's therapeutic touch, isn't it? Right. So uh, okay, if, why can't I call that manual? Why can't we why can't we reframe, reconceptualize and reform the term manual therapy to incorporate therapeutic touch? When you can call it you can, you can call it what you like, but manual therapy is taught as a specific technique that has to be done in a specific way to get specific effects if you're doing something else like passive assistance movements to reduce somebody's fear of movement which i don't think does it very well anyway but that's another discussion um you're going to have to call that something else because that wouldn't come under the term of manual therapy yeah i think that that unfortunately i think that that's where you you you, you there is a i'm uh, wrong is that, that's what you want to say no, where i you... think you're wrong no i do well, i do think you're wrong but i wasn't necessarily well, i think you're wrong that. as well so, yeah, yeah exactly it's good <laughs> but um, i don't mind that but uh, what i'm getting at is i think it's a, a definition that's convenient that i think the fact that you've parameterized what you're meaning by manual therapy and then if i was doing it as a sleight of hand saying well look at all this good stuff that that, I, that actually i mean by it I'm actually granting you that in the most part, manual therapy means what you're describing. However, I'm also meaning that given the, given the infrastructures that exist and the way in which we can make progress, I think that one of the ways in which we can do that is to recognize that we don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater and that therapeutic touch can be a powerful thing done appropriately. And what I've just described there is an example that I would use and, and defend to high heaven the ability to use it in certain circumstances and contexts because you're not inferring a mechanism of effect that's bullshit you're not necessarily creating any passive dependence you're doing it as a means of blurring the lines between assessment and treatment in a totally appropriate manner yeah but you disagree yeah i do disagree <laughs> i do disagree a lot so again you know i think it all comes down to you know how much of it is needed but again that's another discussion as well you know yeah. do, do we actually need to do these things with our touch or therapeutic touch or our hands and manual therapy techniques as well that's another discussion but there sure well and that's one for another day and that, that probably means i can bait you into more um one of the things that i definitely want to try and visit see if i can get that aussie i don't know who that is but it was an interesting video and stuff and i think that there's again a misrepresentation in there but there's a kernel of truth to the fact that there, there is something to be said about uh, the societal expectation on what people come to when they want expert msk therapy right that's an interesting conversation so i'd like to have that with him and potentially we can even get together uh, as a threesome that'd be fun uh, but thanks so much as ever for your time mate really appreciate no it. talking to threesomes that reminds me of your, you and ben putting your fist in your mouth last friday <laughs> oh that's brilliant someone go and watch the better clinician project live stream that him and ben did on friday it was a brilliant moment in which i got chance to be the heckler for a change which i really enjoyed so innuendo anyway, uh, bingo <laughs> it yeah. was innuendo bingo, innuendo bingo. Right. 
we're out of time. Thank you so much to everyone that's commented. I'm definitely going to be visiting the comments afterwards and, and uh, we'll definitely draw on some of those threads and, and produce future episodes, of course. But unfortunately, we are out of time uh, and I've got to have my lunch. I'm starving. So I'll see you all later. Take care. See ya.